morning, everyone. The time is now 9.33, sorry, 9.33, and all board members are present. The State Board of Education meeting of June 11, 2019 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda in the order of priority. Are there any items that board members would like to add or delete from today's agenda? I would like to add uh, the SRO back to the agenda, uh, okay. Fitton Harbor in particular. Okay. So the partnership SRO um, discussion. Yes. So if we look at um, item 11 on the agenda, which are discussion action items, um, put that as the new J. And then the state and federal legislative update will be K. Okay, so we have a recommendation to amend the agenda <coughs> to add the partnership district, Benton Harbor update as item 11J. Second? Support. Support. Discussion? Is there any way that we could move it up to I? Or is, well, I'll, we can just leave it. Just leave it. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. So now we have, um, may I have a motion to approve the amended agenda in order of priority? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, board members, you have an informational folder that contains one item. That item is information on the 2017-18 Carl's D. Perkins Consolidated Annual Report. No action is required at this meeting. This is the informational item for you. At this time, Marilyn, I ask you to please introduce members of the State Board of Education. Yes. You've just been listening to Sheila Alice. She's the Interim State Superintendent and serves as Chairperson of the Board. As we go around the table, the Board's President is Cassandra Albrich. She resides in Rochester Hills. The Board's Vice President is Pamela Pugh from Saginaw. The Board's Secretary is Michelle Fecto. She resides in Detroit. Nikki Snyder is a board member who resides in Dexter. The board's NASB delegate, it's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education, is Tiffany Tilly from Southfield. And next to Tiffany is this year's Teacher of the Year, Laura Chang. She's a K-5 math and reading interventionist in Vicksburg Community Schools when she's not here working with us. And across the table, sitting for, for the governor, representing the governor's office, is Josh Nahart. And next to him, board member Judy Pritchett. Judy is from Washington Township. Lupe Ramos Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. Next to me, the board's treasurer, Tom McMillan, and he resides in Oakland Township. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And now we will meet new members of the MDE team, um, beginning with Scott Kenischek. Would you please in introduce our new employees? Sure, so I'm pleased to introduce three new employees today. I had a chance to visit with them a couple of weeks ago. They bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to the department. So I'd like to introduce all three and then ask if they want to share a few things about themselves. So we have Lee Greenacre joining us uh, on this side. Thank you. Uh, in the Office of Career and Technical Education. Lee, you want to share something about He comes to us um, from the prison system and is very familiar with construction trades and the construction trades industry. Um, and so, um, welcome, Lee. Glad to have you on board. Uh, we also have Julie Smith. Julie is joining us uh, in the office of Great Start in the uh, Child Development and Care Office. Julie? Yes, I'm the Secretary 9 for the Technology, Integrity, and Outreach Unit. I come to you with a bachelor's in communication from Michigan State University and 20 years executive assistant experience uh, with the uh, International Fortune 500. And we also have Christina Collier. Christina is joining us in the Office of Special Ed. Good morning. Um, I'm in the Program Accountability Unit. Um, 
I come from public schools, um, 15 years in special teaching and administration. And Thank you, Scott. And now, Kyle, would you introduce your new staff members? Yes, thanks, Jane. We have two new uh, team members joining our, uh, our division. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Spagnolo, um, the office financial manager. Hi, I'm <coughs> Susan Spagnolo, and I came over here from Liquor Control. Um, prior to that, I was with Unclaimed Property, and I've been with the state for about 15 years. And now I'm working in accounting, finance, travel, and expense. <laughs> also, uh, my pleasure to introduce Beverly Schmidt, also in the Office of Financial Management. Good morning. Um, I'm an accounting manager. With everything from receptionist duties all the way through accounts payable, accounts receivable, things like that. Here. So it was a small company. I got a lot of great experience, and then working for the state for about ten years. Good to hear everyone so sweet. And Thank you, Kyle. And now, Vanessa. Good morning. Uh, it's my first pleasure to introduce Bridget McDowell in our Office of Educator Excellence. Um, I am um, in the OEE in the computer prep unit. Um, I work on the Michigan Department of Education, the former middle school math teacher. Um, I'm to take all that and apply it to the MDE team. Thank you, Vanessa. Do we have any other new MDE team members in the audience today? Okay, seeing none, let's welcome our new staff members to the MDE team. <laughs> welcome. Glad to have you with us. Um, if you plan, this is uh, on public participation. If you plan to offer public comment at today's board meeting, please complete a form and give it to Marilyn. Forms are available on the table just outside the boardroom, and they must be submitted prior to the beginning portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break, scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time to make sure that you have an opportunity to comment. The first item on the Committee of the Whole agenda this morning is the presentation of the proposed standards for the preparation and practice of school social workers. The standards for the preparation and practice of school social workers were written to support the top 10 and 10 strategic goal number three, which is to develop, support, and sustain a high quality, prepared, and collaborative education workforce, as well as the Michigan Department of Education's whole child priority. This set of standards will inform program development and continuous improvement efforts in Michigan's educator preparation institutions. Following a period of public comment, board approval will be requested at the October 8th meeting. Our presenters today are Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Education Student and School Supports, Sean Kopke, Education Consultant Manager, and Sung Tishu, who is our education consultant. And so I'll turn the presentation to the three of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you, Board, for the opportunity to share these important um, standards for the preparation and practice of school social workers. Um, I was just at a meeting yesterday. We were talking about the importance of what we do in higher ed in terms of preparing all of our educators. And so these standards are part of that body of work that we do here at the department to make sure that um, our higher ed institutions know what they, how to build programs to prepare the, the educators we need for the field. So uh, please to, uh, welcome Sung Ti for his first time at the board table. Um, he's excited to be here, I'm sure. <laughs> and you all have seen Sean before, so I'm going to hand the presentation over to them. Good morning. Sung Ti, take it away. OK. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you, Superintendent, and thank you, board members, for, uh, given, for giving us uh, this opportunity to come and present this set of standards to you. Um, so this set of standards address, as Superintendent mentioned, MDE goals 1, 2, and 3 in the top 10 in 10 years strategic plan. More specifically, this set of standards echoes MTE's support for the whole child approach by strengthening the mental health services provided to students, especially students with disabilities, through preparing and providing a stronger school social workforce. 
this set of standards for the preparation and practice of school social worker explicitly address knowledge and skills school social workers must have in today's school to be part of the multi-tier um, system of support team. Okay. The board has not had the opportunity in the past to, to um, to set a set of standards for the preparation of school social workers because the competencies are encompassed in the administrative rules. Um, by moving them out of the rules, the board would have the opportunity to approve them as a set of standalone preparation standards. In addition, standards approve, uh, provide, these set of standards would provide flexibility to the preparation programs while ensure rigor through the MDE internal program review process. So currently, um, there are two sets of schools, I mean, there are two sets of social workers in the schools. As you can see, one set is um, so regular social workers and the other set is, is uh, MDE approved school social worker. And the main difference is the funding, right? The regular social worker, they access general fundings while school social workers access um, special education funding. And, and school social worker are required to have, in addition to the, the social worker license through LARA, MDE approval as well. Sorry. No. So um, right now, what, the reason why we are doing this work right now, there are a couple of re few reasons. One is the administrative rules regarding school social worker were last reviewed in 2011, so it's almost 10 years now. Um, and then also <clears throat> internally, the work of overseeing a school social worker credentialing is being transitioned from the Office of Special Education to the Office of Educator Excellence. Reason being that the of Office of Educator Excellence um, has a better system of um, preparing program um, monitoring and support. Um, and then OS, OE also has a system of educator credentialing as well as OE has dedicated staff for customer service. Okay. And there, um, the rules and the competencies detailed in the administrative rules currently are not as are very task oriented and not comprehensive enough. They only address part of the work that school social workers actually do in the schools. So, and here's the here's the number for the last five years, and you can see uh, the number of credential issued and employed and district employing school social workers have been growing. So we thought this is a great opportunity as well to make sure that we. Uh, strengthen this, this pipeline and these people coming out of the program. And we also have more funding coming down um, that will allow schools to hire more uh, mental health professions, professionals uh, through the 31N, um, the School Mental Health and Support Service Grant. And so we, we just thought this is a good time to do that. Um, we began this. We began the development work in in August of last year, and we involved both external stakeholder groups and internal stakeholder groups. Okay, the external gr uh, group you can see there is a list list on the page four of your handout. The list of individuals, um, there are administrators, pra practitioners, representatives from preparation programs and professional organizations. Internally, we also involved the Office of Special Education, the Office of Great Start, and the Health and Nutrition Services as well. So they both they all have opportunities to provide input <coughs> and to help us finalize this set of standards. Um, at the beginning of the stakeholder group's work, we send out a field survey to understand how the how the field feels about um, the current set of competencies that, that are listed in the <coughs> administrative rules. And overwhelmingly, they agree strongly that that set of rules has great value to guide their work. But what's missing is that it's only the special ed part of the work and not there's, there's no mention of their work with general ed students in general settings. So, so we felt, they feel strongly that we need to encompass that piece of work in the, um, in the new set of standards. 
um, that might include like a restricted um, a child find and tier one to tier one and two of the MTSS system. They they work in that kind of that, that environment as well. Um, the group met virtually every other week uh, for from August to March of the August of last year to March of this year. Um, we had two in-person meetings in November last year and March this year and concluded our work in March of 2019. Um, there are seven, set of, seven standards and 28, 28 elements developed by the stakeholder group, and I will go through that really quick with you. Um, a well-prepared school social worker should know and be able to, um, to do the following, right? Um, standard one is ethics and values. There are two um, elements, and for example, element two says, follows NASW, National Association of School Social Worker Code of Ethics and School Social Worker Standards. Standard two is about assessment. Um, it has six elements, element four is conducts functional assessment behavior. Standard three is about intervention, it has five elements. Element three says, promote positive behavior support for prevention and intervention. Standard four, data-driven <coughs> decision-making and practice evaluation. It has three elements. Element one says, uses data to guide service delivery to students with disabilities and to evaluate own practice regularly to improve and expand services. Standard five, human rights and social and economic justice has four elements. Element one says recognizes a broad range of experiences, personal characteristics, and background variables that influence student learning and development. Standard six, interdisciplinary leadership and collaboration has five elements. Element one says understands the roles of other professionals to promote successful interdisciplinary collaboration. Standard seven is about legal and advocacy, it has three standards. Element three says understand relevant local, state, and federal legislation, statutes, and policies that may impact student family, students, families, school social workers, and other school personnel, including requirements in IDEA and MARS rules. So these are the seven standards. And next, next step, um, following this presentation, we will begin our public comment process. And then we will come back in October for, to share with you the result of the public comment and seek for approval for this set of standards. Um, in the fall of this year, we will begin our technical assistance to our preparation programs for their transition to this new set of standards. And we anticipate by fall, by summer and fall next year, we will have candidates going, starting to, to enroll in these programs, and by spring of 2021, we will have candidates exiting programs and ready to be credentialed. So that is the end of our presentation. Uh, Superintendent, we'll turn it back to you for questions. Thank you very much. And do we have questions or comments from board members? Sung, Sung Tishu, you did a nice job on your first presentation to the board. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Tiffany. I was just wondering why. Um, why the increase? I mean, it's a good thing. Just wondering why. Um, I think, and the team can chime in if they want, but certainly schools' recognition of needing to meet the needs of the whole child, as well as the increase in the number of students coming from trauma, coming from backgrounds. Schools know they need to be able to provide services um, beyond simply academic services, which is really one of the main reasons why we've adopted a whole child focus here at the department. So our policies can help support that and we can do things as explicitly like make sure we have our prep standards and the 31N money that uh, the team here advocated for. So that would be, have we asked anybody or do we, do we, do we have any more data on that? Um, no, we have, we don't have any more data okay. than what we have here, but I think um, echoing what Vanessa says, um, I think it's because this, this schools are recognizing the importance of um, out, like out of school influences that children bring into classrooms in order, in order to provide that support for them for uh, learning and achievement, uh, mental health services is needed. Thank you. 
we do school visits here just to add to that we all the directors and deputies do and I was on several in the last couple of weeks and every single one of them were talking about how many social workers they had how many they wanted to hire how they wish they had more you know it was a common thread um, coming through and I went to a variety of different types of districts too so rural districts kind of suburban districts and I think that's an experience we've all had in our visits I just think it's interesting because we have the um, new teachers declining, but we have the social workers increasing. So I was trying to find, figure it out. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Tom, Judy, and then, okay. Michelle <laughs> oh, and oh, Pam. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thanks for your presentation. So these standards uh, will be used by the, the colleges that, um, and then will it be on, will they be on a test? So the way uh, preparation standard work, standards work is they are the standards for the preparation program. Right. So how to build the program. Okay. So um, what? Are you, yeah. Oh, I'm, okay. What exactly? Number five. So there's nothing more detailed. I mean, when I'm looking at these standards, this is it. There's nothing. Okay. Um, so number five. How how do how will those colleges instruct social potential school social workers to promote social justice. What is, what exactly does that mean? I, where's the, I don't know what the definition, I don't know what economic justice is too, that's my second question, but social justice, how, how can you tell me how specifically they will or is it just kind of thrown out there and they kind of figure out what it means or? Um, I'd like to ground my answer in what the standard says because I think that you're calling a good point that there can be a larger discussion about what these things mean to individuals or in different contexts. So in the standards we talk about um, the idea of we're looking at positive outcomes for individuals and systems and then noting the diverse, uh, the words we use here, diverse and reciproc reciprocal influences of homeschool and community. So the idea, we want our school social workers to understand the embedded context in which the students and families that they're going to be working with exist and have a positive orientation towards supporting students in their context. So the idea of a school social worker shouldn't be trying to push kids in any particular way, but they should be supporting um, equity and access and um, fair treatment for all students. So, do you guys want to add anything? I mean, I, I think advocacy. I mean, social justice is used for all kinds of things, including the push for socialism and equal, making everybody equal, and all this stuff. So, I mean, I don't know. It means various things. So, some colleges may decide it means this and push something farther over here and some there, there's nothing that says this is what we're looking for these teachers to know or these uh, social workers to to know it's all up to interpretation I think it's fair to say yes that the standards I mean that you see this you you're right you see the standards and the detail that they have so like the element one that says recognizes a broad range of experiences personal characteristics and background variables that influence student learning and development how a college might choose to Expose social pre pre um, preparing social workers pre service social workers to that is is left to the program. And then what's economic justice? I mean, justice is a pretty loaded word. I mean, we don't nobody likes injustice, so somehow this is uh, the right thing. So what exactly are you saying is the right way to have economics or to promote economics or? So so the wording. Uh, from well, when the stakeholder group were developed, was developing this this particular standard five, um, I think where they're coming from is to have its diversity. They wanted to be able to recognize that there is a range of diversity, whether economic status or where you know where the kids are coming from, and be able to ground their work in recognition of that diversity and use that diversity in favor of the students to help them achieve and learn. Um, I think that's where they're coming from. But why didn't they yeah. just use that, economic and social diversity? Instead, promoting justice means there is injustice and you've got to right the, just, the injustice. And I just don't know what the injustice of economic, you know, the economic injustice that they are supposedly going to make sure that they don't promote, that they promote only the justice part. I don't, 
Why not just say diversity, economic diversity? So if the board, if you or the board would like to make a recommendation that the standard be named something different, that's feedback we can take during public comment. Okay. I mean, again, I think the goal is what Sung T said. And I think what we have to recognize is there are all sorts of forms of injustice that our students face. So when social workers are working with them, they need to recognize that and support them where they're at. So for example, students in very impoverished settings don't have access to health care. They don't have access to a lot of things that students in a more uh, well-off setting would. A social worker might need to address the needs of that child in a different way than a child who has um, economic security but is struggling with um, peer pressure or bullying or something else. So recognizing that That's fine. That's there's structural injustices. No, that, yeah. Well, injustice because somebody's richer than another person, that's unjust. I don't know. I think that's probably it's, it's a diverse. philosophical debate outside a little bit of the standards. But yes, yeah, that I don't a know student, why it has to go into that. Okay. So we can take, I think that's a good point to take feedback on during the um, comment period. Okay, thank you, Tom. And then to Judy. Uh, just a question on the timing on the next step slide. Um, so standards, um, assuming standards are approved, so these would be social workers who have already uh, received their degrees in social work. And so they might enter the program summer, fall of 2020. So the program really for school social work, specifically to these standards, is approximately eight to nine months full-time at an Yeah, actually it might be faster than that because right now we have um, well, currently, it's about three courses, so nine to ten okay. credits. Yeah, but depending on how the institutions um, redesign their coursework, it right. might be shorter, it might be longer, as long as the standards are addressed. And so, and and the timing also, we kind of built in into um, the time to allow the programs to go through internal process. Because sometimes the universities take a lot longer for them to adjust the coursework. Right. So we wanted to build that in and not push them to do things that they're not ready yet. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle? Yeah, I think um, uh, Judy hit my, uh, hit my question um, pretty well. Um, I just wanted to say I, I, I do um, – uh, like the idea of supporting a more holistic approach to the MTSS and not just having it be you know, focusing on special ed or whatever, that it's something that should be for all teachers should be or be, or all social workers should be versed in, in understanding that. And, um, and then I, I, so I support that. Um, I, uh, I also, um, in Standard 5, I appreciate the, um, the ideas around advocacy and teaching people to um, to advocate for improving their 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 um, where they are in in, in life, so um, I uh, I support that um, that initiative, and I think that's really important that people learn to uh, have their own voice and uh, speak out. Okay, thank you, Michelle and Pam. Hi, I was gonna keep it simple until my counterpart. <laughs> raise some very uh, uh, critical issues. So the first thing that I was going to ask about was just how does this blend in with the, with the health of kids? We know that there's also um, a nurse, a school nurse shortage, and we know that the health of kids definitely, uh, you know, will, should align um, with some of these other things that the social worker would be addressing, especially from the whole child approach, even some of the environmental factors in schools, out of schools, and where many of the many of our children uh, live and reside. So I guess the first question would be um, around how is that integrated? Because I, I love seeing the, the social and the economic uh, justice, and then I would probably wonder around health equity and, and uh, environmental justice. I would add another justice. <laughs> Um, so that's a great question. I think that a lot of the how we think about delivery of services to students an integrated um, whole child, um, whole child, whole school, whole community delivery model of services isn't completely reflected here because these are the standards for one part right. of that delivery of services. But standard six talks about the interdisciplinary leadership and collaboration and the importance of being on the multidisciplinary teams, looking at different data. 
um, the legal and advocacy kind of understanding, you know, the roles that the district, the legal responsibilities that they have, um, but also the advocacy for what they might need. But I think standard six is probably the part where we flag to a social worker that they, ideally it won't be an island. They'll be working with the, the teams in the districts and schools to provide that um, integrated services to students. And then outside of these standards, uh, work coming out of Kyle's shop, uh, work that the whole department's doing around how do we support schools in this kind of integrated service delivery model um, with these slotting in and aligned to that. So, so these don't fully handle all the health advocacy, but I think prepare the social workers to be part of a team that would address that need. Okay, because we're seeing more and more where social workers, I mean, just in Flint where I work, where social workers work very closely with health, you know, because if you have a neural toxin that a child is, is uh, uh, exposed to, then we know that it can end up having things that play out that look like uh, social behavioral things. We also, I commend you for looking at the justice side of things because if we don't start rolling back uh, some of the things that <coughs> from racism, uh, classism that, that has been done uh, to many of our populations, then we'll stay right, right where we are. And I could go on and on about that, but I'll just leave it there and, and we could you know provide the research that, that shows that racism, racism did exist and it, Still, uh, if we don't um, uh, make some of those situations just and keep going in the way that we're going, we're going to still keep having the, the same uh, effects that, that we're having now. Thank you, Pam. And now we will, we will move to Nikki. Um, I'm just curious about standard three and four and the, the discussion kind of what I'm thinking sort of fits together. but. Let me ask a few questions. Uh, what does it mean to make data-driven decisions um, when we are dealing with behavioral problems or relational opportunities to impact a student positively? Um, that's a really great question, and I think, I think you're right that not every type of data that informs the decision that a school social worker might need to make is collected or collectible. Um, that being said, schools do have access to data around things like discipline, background data on the students, possibly health data, you know, to Pam's point. The, the, the point we're trying to, probably much like nursing, although you probably have more have access to more like quantifiable data, but there's always something you probably can't quantify. And so when you're making a decision, when a school social worker is trying to make a decision about appropriate approaches for the students, we want them looking at all the data that's available, including things like their observations or contextual factors or qualitative reports from teachers or things like that to try to paint a holistic <coughs> picture of students and not just say something like, this student is poor, so we need to do X, Y, Z. Well, maybe that has nothing to do with, or maybe that's a contributing fact, you know, like look at the data. But I think you're right that there, it's not like every data point that a school social worker or a team in a school might use would be something that can be easily put in a spreadsheet or a chart. And then when it comes to yeah. intervention, knowing that the outcome of an intervention can be pretty impactful on a student's future or even access to opportunity. Um, I just wonder, you know, I, I, guess, I guess I'll have to think about that particular area that I'm thinking about a little bit more and we'll have more opportunity to discuss this, right? Um, and then I'm also just thinking in general from, from a perspective of social work, looking at it as a mental health sort of, you know, discussion. Parents typically bring their child to the counselor if they need to or if they had access to funds in another avenue, it might be more of a private avenue to bring their child to a counselor if they needed to um, or wanted to. So there's, so there's some, like, gray area here of exactly where are we going with this? And is there still parental notification and consent of the data being collected and used? And precisely, um, what if a parent just says, you know, I don't, I don't want my child to have access to that service during the school day. If we think that, that my child needs access to this, then let's do it outside of the school day. Is that something we would honor and respect and make available? Because, you know, it's a school record, right? That's, I'm sort of just thinking um, about confidentiality and how we all uh, honor confidentiality in a number of areas of our life that have nothing to do with work or school. Yeah. So I just wonder about that, too. So I think in the future, I'd like to know um, 
is there consent around the data that's being collected? Is there consent around whether or not a parent knows that their child is accessing mm -hmm. social work services at school? And um, is there a record being kept? So, you know, just, just that there's that constant communication with parents. And, yeah. That, you know, maybe that parent does not want or need that service in an educational setting. Not that it wouldn't benefit a student if they do. Either of you have information on this? or I'm I, feeling like this I might don't. be one we need to research a little bit more. Um, my understanding is that there's still parental consent involved in these sorts of when a student is receiving services through social work at the school, but I think we should do a little bit more research because you ask a series of questions about consent and collection that I think we'll do more research on and get, and get back with you. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'm going to go to Lupe and then I'll come back to Michelle. Okay. Well, first of all, I appreciate that uh, after eight years, we're rehatching and revisiting the standards. Having worked in schools for as long as I did, this wraparound services, people are crying for social workers, counselors, uh, gym teachers, uh, music teachers, art teachers. So this is one component that will help in, in schools. Now, you, I, I like that you identify the two kinds of social workers uh, because in, in many schools where I taught, we had the, what do you call the special ed social workers? School, school social, social worker. worker. Okay, the school social workers. Okay, we had the school social workers, but we didn't have the regular social workers. And so then if I had a problem or, or a concern with a student, the uh, school social worker could not see that child. And so then the teacher had to take, do the best that they could with the situation. They do come to us with many, many different kinds of situations. Most of my career was in inner city schools. And, and I, I had to be many different, I wore many hats in the classroom. Now, you, you know, I am the chairperson of the committee to honor Cesar Estrada Chavez, a person that taught social justice, that worked social justice, that communicated, that, that expanded, that taught, that so we live by principles. And, and so his principles are very closely to what I'm reading about social justice. Uh, social justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. And you know, it also says social justice is based on the concepts of human rights and equality and can be defined as the way in which human rights are manifested in the everyday lives of people at every level of society. And so, I appreciate that social justice is very much part of the standards. Economic justice, I understand it completely. I work with students, they were homeless, they didn't have a place to bathe, they didn't have, they didn't have. And so it was my responsibility as a teacher to, to see if I could get them uh, permission from their parents to take a shower at school because both schools in my area had uh, a shower and then I as a teacher had towels, had soap, had shampoo, had toothbrushes, had, I would go and ask dentists, whomever, so I could have those things in the classroom. That's economic justice. So I knew those students didn't have it. When a student said by one, a student that wasn't, hadn't taken a bath for a while, and then they said complaining about the student, that it was my responsibility to help that student. So students come to us with many different levels of economic support. And so I understand exactly what you're talking about when you say social justice and when you talk about economic justice. Because our students are, and each and every one of those students that come to our classrooms every day, 
we have to dignify and respect. And so it's very important that we as the educators and future educators, because these programs are gonna be going into, um, into the universities and colleges to prepare the, the social workers. And that word just <laughs> social worker, social, it's a social component that the student brings to the classroom. And so I, I am very hopeful uh, that these standards are going to be um, accepted at the end of the day. Probably, you know, it, as you go, there's going to be changes. Uh, but I, I respect the fact that they have been initiated. So thank you. Thank you, Lupe. And now to Michelle. Just a quick question. So I, I see in standard seven that you know, you talk about IDEA and MARS as having an understanding, but um, I'm wondering if there was some discussion or um, or if it could be more explicit about the, the legislation that was passed on the seven factors before suspension and expulsion, because um, I think that's in, uh, important that social workers understand, because it, it seems like a lot of schools don't understand that. I mean, it's still fairly new. And then the restraint and seclusion laws that, um, that seem to have, there's some confusion around. So I just want to make sure that that was, um, covered, clearly covered, mm -hmm. and, and not overgeneralized. And I did notice that this says the number of school social workers, so it doesn't say the number of regular social workers have increased. Because I know and well, what Lupe and others have said, that there's a dire need, oh, especially with MTSS and restorative justice. People want to do these things, but they just don't have the resources because we don't have the resources. <laughs> um, and I don't know if there's any... Uh, anything. And the final thing I was going to say, I mentioned self-advocacy. I noticed there's a lot of the social workers do the advocacy, but I think the, in whether you call it justice or advocacy, the not me, that as long as people understand that they, um, they're they taught to um, participate in, in our, our democracy and um, to advocate for themselves um, to get what they need and to organize with others or whatever it is, to, <laughs> however they do it, by learning what the laws are or writing to their, I don't know. But I think it's important that um, students themselves develop a, um, to, advocate for, to teach them to advocate for themselves in an as effective way. I think that's critical. Not just people helping them, which is important, but even more important, it's they take control. Thank you, Michelle. Any other comments, questions from board members? Okay. Vanessa, Sungti, and Sean, thank you very much for your presentation. We thank wish you the you best so. as you go out for public comment, and we look forward to revisiting these at the October State Board meeting. Next item on the Committee of the Whole meeting is a presentation on school finance. In the spring of, uh, this is the third in the series of presentations on this topic. So today's topic is on special education funding subcommittee report. In the spring of 2017, former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly called for a subcommittee of the Lieutenant Governor Special Education Reform Task Force to focus on special education finance in Michigan schools, particularly with regard to student outcomes. At that time, Dr. Scott Kenischek was the superintendent of the Ingham Intermediate School District, and he served as a subcommittee chair. Scott is here to share information that's included in this report. Scott, we welcome you to the board table. We look forward to your presentation, which is an informational item and does not require any action on behalf of the board. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, and thank you to the board for allowing me to spend some time this morning um, talking about special ed finance. It's very complex. Um, but I think uh, the presentation will try to make the complexes um, as simple um, as we can make that. I am joined by John Anderjack and Scott Kemmer Slater. Thank you. Um, Scott Kemmer Slater, who work uh, with these numbers every day. So if there are much more technical questions than what I can answer, these two gentlemen um, are certainly going to be able to, um, to help with that. So a little context on the, the, uh, the information that you received. As uh, Sheila said, I was a, a superintendent at the Ingham ISD and also fortunate enough to serve on the Lieutenant Governor's Task Force for Special Ed. Um, and we did a great deal of work, worked very closely with Michelle um, on that task force. Um, one of the things that we did was, uh, was uh, commission a study and do a study around finance. Um, the Lieutenant Governor at the time um, had an interest in identifying the shortfall, um, and then in particular, uh, for us to identify what he called areas in need of further investment. Um, and so the report that you received um, has 
more information than what I'm going to go over uh, regarding areas that we felt were great needs of investment. Um, I will say that our number one need was um, early on, early on dollars, Section 54D, and we're fortunate um, to be sitting in a budget year where the state has contributed $5 million of general fund dollars to the early on program. But So there's more information in here than just the numbers. I'm not going to hit that. Um, but uh, um, So we started working in the spring of 17. Uh, again, we were uh, tasked with identifying the shortfall, quantifying the shortfall, and identifying areas in need of improvement. Um, the subcommittee that worked on this was myself, uh, Paul Badea, uh, who was the CFO at Macomb ISD, Christy Callahan, uh, who works for Clinton Risa uh, in the early childhood realm. Dave Campbell uh, is a superintendent at Kalamazoo Risa. Mike Conlin is a professor of economics at Michigan State University. Uh, Bill Drake uh, is a legislative assistant to Representative Frank Liberati. Frank served on this uh, committee as well. Chris Frank, a CFO at Saginaw ISD. Uh, Marcy Lispett, uh, who is an advocate uh, from the education world. Mark McWilliams also uh, served on this, representing uh, Michigan Protection and Advocacy Services, uh, and the staff member was Christy Seelhoff. So kind of gives you an idea of who did um, the work and who was involved. The data that I'm going to share with you reflect 2015-2016 numbers, so this is a little bit old. Uh, when Dr. Arson was here, he, he mentioned a number that was updated, was a little greater um, in scale, I'll get to that. So um, these are probably conservative numbers given the fact that this is um, data that's uh, now three years old. And again, what I'm going to share with you is a, a fairly simple balance sheet, but yet with some complex numbers. So all of you in your packet should have received a one-pager that looks like this. Um, and the graphic is, is, uh, is certainly on the screen. What I'm going to do is walk you through that, um, and it is a balance sheet of sorts. It's going to um, exhibit the revenues on the, the side um, of special ed funding and then the expenditures, and we'll eventually arrive um, at the, uh, the shortfall that, uh, that we know exists. So with that, I'm going to start to walk you through. Uh, I will entertain questions as we go through. If you want to wait till the end, that's fine as well. So um, top of the one pager are our federal revenues. Um, we spend and receive out of three pots of money in special ed, uh, one being the federal pot, one being the state pot, one being the local pot. So we're going to start with federal revenues. Um, and the federal dollars that we get uh, for under IDEA amount to about $363 million dollars. We also receive Medicaid funds um, from the federal government to the tune of about $109,000, and those Medicaid funds are passed on to local school districts. So the total cost, uh, uh, yes? Million, million, 109 million. A billion, sorry, yes. Um, so the total costs uh, or total revenues that we receive from the federal government is around $473 uh, million, excuse me, yes. Um, when IDA was created um, in, in Congress uh, in 1975, they pledged to fund 40% of the cost of special ed. Um, and uh, they're far from it. Um, our most recent estimates is that right now the federal government's funding about 15% of our costs. And so um, we know on the federal side um, that um, what they pledged in 1975 isn't, uh, isn't necessarily coming to fruition. And so those three numbers represent the top three numbers, again, on the balance sheet in terms of what we receive from IDA. Uh, that goes to local districts as well as Medicaid funds that are passed on to local districts. Takes us to state revenues. This gets a little more complex. Um, there are many pots of, of revenues all under the section 50s within the school aid budget. And so I'm just going to start to walk you through them. Um, again, if you have questions, I will certainly field them. So the first pot of revenues on the state side is section 51A2. Um, and this is the, the foundation allowance for children with disabilities. So in the special ed world, um, a student uh, with a disability is funded either at the foundation allowance or at 28% of the expense associated with their reimbursement, whichever is greater. I'm going to say that one more time. So a child with a disability is funded at one of two levels, the, the, uh, the foundation allowance or 28% of the expenses associated with, uh, with their services, whichever is greater of the two. So this particular pot represents the foundation allowance for children with disabilities in the state of Michigan, and it amounts to about $263 million. Again, I'm not going to go through all of the, the zeros, but so this is the foundation allowance associated with children with disabilities um, in the state of Michigan. Below that, um, Section 51A3 is about a million dollars, um, and this is a pot of money um, that goes to uh, approximately, make sure I have my number of districts are correct goes to approximately 53 districts to hold them harmless um, uh, with regard to their revenues um, 
in, so that their revenues do not fall below the, the prior level of, um, of what they were funded at 1997. So it's a hold harmless provision. It's a small pot of money. Um, and again, about 53 districts tap this pot um, to make sure that they're not receiving less money today than what they were receiving um, in uh, 1997. Next line is 51A6. This is a little over $2 million, uh, and this too has some history associated with it. This goes back to 1987. So there was a rules package uh, that was passed and uh, approved in 1987 that increased the costs for some districts to provide programs um, in their districts. Um, so the deal was, is if this rules package passed, um, and there was an increase in cost to you, they would be able to tap this particular line to um, be reimbursed for those increased costs. There are about 18 districts that hit this particular um, um, line item, so again, to the tune of about $2.2 million. Below that, we have Section 51A11. Um, this one here is uh, pays the foundation allowance for Section 53A pupils, and these are, in the special ed world, um, what we call court place pupils. Um, so these are pupils that are placed in either a juvenile detention facility, a child care facility, or a facility that's run by DHHS. So this is the foundation allowance associated with some of those. Um, in Ingham, at Ingham ISD, we um, provided the educational services for Highfields, if you're familiar with that program. Um, and so that would be an example of a, one of these types of settings. Again, the foundation allowance for the student, that line item is about three point, or students, that line item is about $3.8 million. This is the largest chunk um, of the reimbursements or of the revenues on the revenue side. This is the, the 28%. When you hear about students uh, that, are, uh, the, that we reimburse for 28% of their costs, um, this is the pot, uh, $624 million. Um, this goes back to a court decision back in the late 90s uh, called Durant, if you remember those days or familiar <laughs> with those days. Um, and it says that the state reimburses 28% um, of the special ed expenses, uh, and on the transportation side, they, uh, they reimburse 70%, and you're going to see a little more about transportation here shortly. But this is the largest pot uh, with regard to um, the revenues. Section 56, uh, again, another section of the budget. This really deals with, tries to deal with equalization. So these dollars go to some intermediate school districts to try to help equalize um, funding across ISDs, and I'm going to show you um, what that looks like. So the purpose of this is to supplement their ISD millage, um, providing for lower funded ISDs uh, with some extra funds. Um, and ISDs receive greater payments for having less valuable property to tax and higher local tax rates. So there's a very complex formula that's associated with it. Um, and there are, any time, I would say between 15 and 20 districts that receive these $56 give or take 15 to 20 districts. Some districts come in formula, some districts go out of formula. Um, but the idea of these equalization dollars is to try to equalize funding at the, that local, at the ISD level, local ISD level. Section 53, uh, this is the uh, foundation allowance for, of the approved costs um, uh, minus the foundation allowance. And so we talked about um, one of the prior lines being the foundation allowance for the court place pupils. This particular line um, covers the rest of the costs, um, the excess costs above and beyond the foundation. And again, about $10.5 million. So the total state revenues, if you are following along on the balance sheet, add up to about $943 million. We've seen the federal revenues, they line up at about $473 million. So we have one more pot of revenues to take a look at, and that's the local revenues. And when I say local, again, I mean ISDs. <coughs> So ISDs um, have special ed millages, um, and they levy these millages to pay for special ed services um, within their districts. Um, there is a cap on what ISDs can levy for their millage, um, and it cannot exceed 1.75 times their 1993 rate. Um, and these have to be approved by um, the residents uh, in the ISDs. Um, it get, this gets very complex in that all ISDs have different taxable values, and they also have different tax levies. And this creates tremendous inequities, and I'm going to give you a very concrete example of that. Um, before I do that, though, if you added up all 56 ISD special ed millages, that number amounts to $959 million um, in some change. So if you look at the differences leading to inequity, um, on this particular slide, um, what we see is 
the differences in these ISD millages. Um, and it's the middle box, probably cannot read that. I will try to walk you across that. Middle box, uh, it says special education and then millage. Uh, the average mills levied uh, across ISDs is 2.95. The median is 2.4958. I'm just walking to the right. And here's where some of the inequities exist. The highest levying uh, ISD in the state of Michigan levies about 6.2764 mills, over six mills for special ed. If you go further to the right, the lowest debt levying ISD levies 0.6329. So you can see just on the debt levy itself, there's a drastic difference between what ISDs levy from the highest to the lowest. If you multiply that times the taxable values of those two ISDs, the highest special education levying ISD generates about $1,725 per pupil. The lowest debt levying ISD in special ed generates $162 per pupil. So just because of where you're born at the local level, there is a difference of about $1,500 per pupil with regard to ISD millages. It's just inherent to the system that we have. Um, but you can see where the inequities um, um, certainly can exist. So total revenues, if you're still following along on the balance sheet, we know that the total revenues uh, available for special ed in Michigan is a little over $2.3 uh, billion. We've got local revenues at 959, state revenues at 943, federal revenues at 473, again, adding them up all equal about 2.3, almost $2.4 billion. So questions on the revenue side? Lupe. Lupe. Oh, so, so then, okay, so there's inequities in the local level because of the property tax. But, okay, but this is the amount in the state. That the, is this the amount that, that is um, allocated to the students in the federal, state, and local? Yep, if you so add up. So how much money does each student get out of this pot, out of the total pot? That's going to vary by student, by local school district, by ISD. Now, there isn't one single amount that every single child with a disability gets. It's dependent upon the services they need, dependent upon the ISD in which they live. Um, there's a lot of variables. But does, does the, okay, so there's inequities, and I understand locally the inequities. But the, the other pots of money, the, the school districts are allocated the same. Or depending on the needs of the students, or how is this, all this money allocated then? So the federal dollars are allocated based upon a formula, um, both on the IDA side and on the Medicaid side. It's a fairly complex formula. Interesting thing is that uh, of the three factors go into the formula, none of them have to do anything with special ed. Um, and so those dollars then go to the ISD. ISDs allocate those dollars diff differently as well, depending upon um, the funding plan within the ISD. And so there is no one way to get to a, a very specific number. Um, Can I add on to that? Can, Nikki? So there is a way to get to the specific number of the inequity at the local level, but there isn't a way to get to a specific number of how the differences vary in terms of federal dollars go to maybe the district that needs it more? Because my understanding is that that's not necessarily true. No, okay. All ISDs have different, 56 different ISDs, 56 different funding plans, and the IDA dollars go through the ISDs. They disperse them. So could we have access to exactly what IDEAs got each one, mm -hmm. each ISD? Yeah, we have that. Because that would, it would be good to know, I think, how that balances out the local inequity. We have that. Okay. So let's move on to the uh, expenditure side. So in the special ed world, um, we complete, uh, uh, districts and ISDs complete two reports. One is called the SE4096, one is called the SE4094. And basically, um, we tally up our expenses related to special ed. And we submit those to the department, to John and to Scott and their team, um, on a yearly basis. Those reports are due in September. Um, and so if you look at the special ed 4096 costs, the first line 
um, that are associated with um, children with disabilities who aren't court placed pupils. There's two lines. Um, this is the bulk of our students. The expense associated um, with those students as reported by our locals and ISDs is a little over $2.4 billion. Again, those are students with disabilities who are not court placed. Um, and again, the expense about $2.4 million, billion, excuse me. The line below that, I will go back to court placed pupils. And so these are section 53 students who are court placed. Uh, the expenses associated with them as reported by either ISDs or locals um, is about $13 uh, million. So those are the first two expenses that are reported. I mentioned transportation. Um, many of our students with disabilities um, are transported to and from school. And the costs associated with that transportation um, is reported on what's called the SC4094. That particular expense um, uh, is about $235 million to transport our students with disabilities um, to and from schools. And then the final expense that we have are, are federal dollars that we saw as a revenue. We have to obviously mark those federal dollars as an expense because what comes in then goes back out. And that, again, if you uh, cross-reference that, is the $363 million. And so if you add those expenses up, the total expenditures are a little over $3 billion. Um, and we know that the revenue amount, going back, uh, is the second line, a little over $2.4 billion. So the shortfall amounts to about $692 million, uh, almost $700 million. Again, if Dr. Arson was, were here, I, I think he's crunched some of these numbers. I think as we sit here today, that that number probably is over um, $700 million. I can't guarantee that. Um, but just picking up on some of the comments that he made, um, it probably has... Uh, has uh, crept above that 700 million line. So what does this mean? It means that we're funding special ed right now in Michigan at about 77% of um, the costs. So the state and federal and, lo and local revenues um, are equate to about 77%. That leaves 23% unfunded, 23% unfunded. But as you know, with special ed, these are services that these children um, are guaranteed um, by law. And so those dollars have to come from somewhere. And those dollars come from uh, local district general funds. Um, and this too is an equity issue. Uh, on average, uh, about $459 of every foundation is used to cover the shortfall. Um, and Dr. Arson, and again, he mentioned a little over 500. So again, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's updated these numbers. Um, and that's on average. And if you think about districts with a higher population of special ed students, that is an, that's an equity issue because those districts are having to use more of the 459s than perhaps districts who have a lower population of children with disabilities. So we know it's about $459 of every foundation to cover the shortfall. Um, if you boil the numbers down to actual FTEs, we know that there are about 200,000 students with IEPs in the state of Michigan. Um, some are, are a full FTE, so full-time special ed. Some are a small portion. If they have a speech and language impairment, perhaps that may, they may be 0.14. So if you boil those 200,000 IEPs down to true FTEs, there's about 60,000 uh, FTEs. Um, and if you simply take the 692 million, divide it by 60,000, uh, we're underfunding about 11,498 per special education FTE if we're looking to break even. Um, and so as we boil the numbers down, um, that's really what we're talking about. So I would inter entertain questions if you have them. Again, if they're technical, I'm going to Yield to my colleagues uh, to the right. Okay, we'll start with Michelle. Thank you. Um, I think this is really um, critical. Um, I think we bring this, these issues have been brought up, but what we need is um, uh, we need action um, by those who control the funding mechanisms to, uh, to step forward. I also think it's important, I worked on. Um, a task force just looking at the Detroit um, school special ed, and, um, and I'm talking to um, Pam about some concerns that are probably even greater in the Flint area. So the so one thing that was um, came out of this, which was chaired by uh, Randy Liapa and um, John Ricolta, so it was a very uh, interesting group of folks from business, you know, both sides of the aisle um, uh, discussion. <clears throat> But everyone understood that in Detroit, um, there was a structural deficit that was not um, addressed with the, um, the funding that came through to sustain the um, district when it was in such uh, financial straits. And the, 
so because we are we are saturated by um, and I'll, by charter schools that um, if you look at the FTEs do not provide the services especially for some of the more higher need children um, the, the data just bears that out um, so what happens is you have a higher concentration of the Detroit of the kids with special needs um, in the general ed setting in the um, the Detroit traditional public schools which are, were you know struggling financially anyway and it, and so and I've talked to principals who said you know even though there's things on the IEP that says they're going to get all these services they just don't have the resources to provide the services so it creates all sorts of complaints from and issues um, a strain. I mean, I really believe that no one around that table wants to deny a kid who needs services services. But when the money is not there, it um, it may, it puts everybody between a rock and a hard place. And um, so, but but the concern is that there's this um, sort of a pushing of kids for whatever reasons. I mean, I I don't know if it's um, you know, but I think there's incentives financially not to take kids that are high needs. Nobody wants them. I mean, I was at a Detroit magnet school. My son was kicked out the first day of kindergarten. It was a regular Detroit public school, but it was a magnet school where that had a waiting list to get in, and um, they uh, operated as a private school. And, and I had this, and I, and I mentioned this before, we then called 35 different charter schools, and they all denied him, uh, said, <laughs> we don't have services for him. Go somewhere else. Um, so... So we ended up back in the traditional um, uh, public schools, and um, and it's it's just they are estimated. I've heard dis different estimates that it leaves Detroit with a somewhere like the lowest estimates like twenty million a year, highest estimate sixty million dollars a year of structural deficit that is built in every year because they have to provide these services, and a lot of people are not getting services that they should. I think because of the financial strain. Now, I, I say that in, then and look at Flint. So in Flint, now Genesee County, I believe, is the one that the ISD gets the lowest amounts of money for the millage. I think that was the one. No, it is not. It's not? Oh, I no, thought not, it was. Not but based it, on the data that we have. Okay. From. All right. So then I, but it's, it's not very high. I would assume Genesee County is probably. I don't have a list of their millage okay. rates, but I can get Yeah, that. I remember looking at it before, and it was pretty low. Um, based on their housing values, and um, she's saying that right now they have, uh, it's estimated they have about 22% of their population has IEPs expected to grow to 30, um, where they don't have, so the, the system is built, it's a structural issue um, uh, that we have uh, with Prop A and, um, you know, the funding mechanisms that we have and just how we underfund special education in general. So, um, so I'm particularly concerned about uh, how to incentivize people to or institutions to want to provide or to make it easier for them to provide these services. I also think a lot of the high stakes standardized tests, I've seen that too, where kids get pushed out because they're afraid their test scores, they're harder to teach, their test scores are not going to be, or, you know, maybe not as high as, uh, as others. So... Um, there's these built-in disincentives in the, throughout the whole system. So I think there needs to be a real comprehensive look at our special education. Um, and I know that there's efforts being made to try to do that, but uh, the bottom line is, it, is that it needs more funding. That's the first clear thing that, and we need leaders to step up and to, um, to push for that. So thank you for listening to my long. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Now move over to Tom. Um, Thanks for the presentation. Sure. So when I look at this one slide just before the, the last one, before questions, it mentions approximately 23% is underfunded. And it says the, the last bullet point is we're underfunding by $11,500 per special ed FTE. So does that mean we, so the 23% represents 11,500? 11,500 11, is- funding them by about, by, by about thirty-three thousand dollars. So per. the eleven thousand four ninety-eight is simply taking the six hundred ninety-two million dollars shortfall, right? Dividing that by sixty thousand two hundred nine right. special ed FTE, and that gets to eleven thousand four hundred ninety-eight dollars per special ed so, FTE. So what are we funding per FTE? 
that's again is going to vary, vary depending upon well, the, but the average. I mean, because if twenty, if we're underfunding twenty three percent and it's eleven thousand five hundred, that means that we're funding the reciprocal or seventy seven percent. So that would be three times that amount, about thirty three thousand dollars on average. I don't had I haven't done the math in my mind, but yes, I think you, you'll, you're yeah. following the same. So math. I mean, yes. if we're you know, I know that that may not seem like a lot of money, but it seems to me like it's pretty good amount. Is there a way to use that money more wisely? I mean, I... I Tom, you're saying $33,000 per pupil per year? Per, per pupil, pupil per, per, per FTE. FTE. Per FTE. Per FTE. Per FTE. So, I, FTE. so right. if that's the case, I mean, and I know that it's not, what is it, 200000 total, and FTE is about... With so, IEPs. 200000 students right. with, with IEPs, yeah. So, okay, divide by three. So it's about 10000 uh, So I, I guess I'm just looking at... Are there better? Are there ways to use that money more wisely? You know, I mean, the, it's a lot of money, yeah. the and needs so I don't vary, know so. if yeah. there's a way to through. Um, you know, I know it's a bad word in some areas, but choice or some way to you know, a parent can say, you know, I, this money is would be better used this way for my child. I believe, or I, I don't know. Is there is there any attempts instead of just looking at more money, but spending the money why, better? So I'm going to answer that a couple of ways. First, I'm going to go back just that all ch the, every child with an IEP is unique, and their needs are very, very different. Again, you can have a child who has a speech and language impairment that may receive a half hour a week of speech therapy, and then within five or six months, then they, um, they no longer qualify. You have that. Um, I know back to, I believe it was 2004, the average cost for a child with autism is $52,000. So you talk about 33 being average, um, and we know the, the explosion and the growth of children with autism. Um, it's, it's grown exponentially over the years. So it depends upon the need of the child. We have a lot of students um, that, um, you know, students that are um, tube fed on a daily basis, have a, come to school on a ventilator, with a ventilator. Some of our students require one-on-one -on -one nurses. So it's, I, I would go back to it depends upon the needs of the child. Could it be done differently? You know, the Education Commission of the States um, just came out with um, one of their reports a couple of months ago that looks at all 50 states and how they fund special ed, Tom. Um, and there are different ways to do it. Um, there's a multiple student weight system. There is a single student weight system. Um, there's a census-based system, resource allocation model, a reimbursement system, which is what we have here. Um, and other states have that. Wyoming has a reimbursement system. Wyoming reimburses 100% of the special ed costs, so they're fully funded. Um, there's a block grant system, and then um, perhaps maybe this is one of the things you're thinking about. There's a high-cost student system. So there's other ways to do it. I, I, there's a whole bunch of information I can share with you um, at a different presentation, perhaps, but um, that, that's what's going on across the country. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And now to Nikki. So I just want to repeat, I would like the information on the federal and state dollars that get um, funneled to ISDs. And if we have to break it down according to how many students those ISDs serve, um, whatever, I, I, w I just want to know, I want the equivalent information of federal and state dollars that we kind of shared here today of local dollars. Like to sort of see how the current pot of money is allocated on the yeah. whole. Yeah. And federal's pretty easy. I know that spreadsheet exists because I've worked with it many times. Um, state uh, may be a little more complex, but we will get to work on that, Nikki. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from board members? Um, yes, to, Michelle. So there's, um, there are, there has been discussion about other ways to try to, you know, I went around on the listening tour with Callie. I was on the task force with him. I, I serve on, on, on some uh, organizations that service um, kids with special needs. Um, and there are there are always discussions about ways to try to provide better services, you know. Um, but it it really, I mean, anybody who takes a look at all the, really takes a look at it, including um, Lieutenant Governor Kelly, who had I think has came to realize that funding is is a critical. We do need to increase the funding. It's it's not. Um, it's not a, just a matter, I mean, there are better practices, but the fact that it is so underfunded and has been for a long time, um, Republicans and Democrats that I've worked with have, have all always <laughs> seemed to 
come to that realization that it, it's 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 a it's a critical issue. And it's just a matter about how much people care about kids with special needs, and um, uh, and whether we're going to step up and um, and uh, make sure that they're not um, that they that, that they can be all they can be, you know. I, so I mean, the unemployment rate of kids with disabilities is is like. I know with autism, it's something like 90%. 90% with autism, <laughs> 70% for yeah. a student with a disability. Yeah, so, and we have to do better on these outcomes for these kids. So. Uh, I, huh? I, I would just say that I just did a quick Google search. It looks like Wyoming is not going to be fully funding 100% in the future. I don't know if that was because the costs were too difficult, but they're cap. I mean, the articles I'm reading say that from a few months ago that they're capping the amount now. So I don't know. That would be new. Yeah, that would be new. Right. Okay. Seeing no other comments or questions from board members, thank you, Scott, for taking a very thank complex you. topic and making it easy for us to understand. We appreciate it. Appreciate the time. We have completed the committee of the whole portion of the State Board of Education meeting, and we will now return to the regular meeting. The next item of the regular meeting is the approval of the State Board of Education minutes. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting of May 7th, 2019? So moved. Second? Second. Second. I have motion and support. Is there any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye, please. Aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next is the approval of the minutes of the regular committee of the whole meeting on May 14th, 2019. May I please have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. We have a motion and we have a second. Okay, we have motion and support. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Um, now we have the approval of the minutes of the retreat of May 22nd, 2019. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting of May 22nd? So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, may I, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Those opposed? Motion carries. And now we'll move on to the report of the president. Cassandra? Well, we have a, a, a very tight agenda today, so I will be extremely brief. Um, I thank you for that conversation on the special ed funding. I thought that was um, really uh, enlightening. And uh, it raises, I think it brings back the conversations that we've had about differentiating, differentiated funding and the need for recognizing that there are students in the state of Michigan that are, it takes more resources to educate and they still have, they have a right to that education. So I hope that we can continue to have that conversation moving forward. Uh, the second thing I would also say is uh, we have the social studies standards on the agenda today. I wanna thank everyone who has reached out to us uh, and express their opinions. Um, some have been in favor, some have been opposed, and, and you know, some have just requested some, some minor changes. Uh, we appreciate all of the, the interest and um, the expressions of, of support or opposition, and uh, look forward to having that vote this afternoon as well, because as you all know, it's been five years in the making. So uh, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Um, for my interim state superintendent report this morning, I am going to share some of my thoughts and reflections on um, what this past year has been like for me, as this is likely my final opportunity to chair the State Board of Education meeting as the interim state superintendent. Um, last year, going back to last May, actually it was last spring, um, when the late superintendent Brian Whiston asked me to take on the role of the interim state superintendent, I told him no, that I wasn't interested. Um, and after a, about an hour conversation, um, he convinced me that, um, yes, I was, he had the faith and, um, in me and believed that I was capable of doing the job. Um, he also said because I didn't want the job was a perfect reason for me to be the interim <laughs> superintendent. Um, and while I have enjoyed being the interim state superintendent, I have stayed true to my um, position that I was not going to apply for the job, and I didn't this past spring. So um, last May, you, the State Board of Education, appointed me as the interim state superintendent. At that time, 
and I still am today, both honored and humbled to have been in this position the past almost 14 months, plus being the first woman in almost 200 years um, to be in this position. I felt a great sense of responsibility following Brian and also being um, the first woman. So when I first assumed this position, I felt it was important for me to identify and share what my priorities were going to be during the, this interim position. And I selected two priorities. One was to provide continuity in the department between the passing of Brian and the appointment of a permanent state superintendent and also to continue the momentum that Brian had started um, to make Michigan a top 10 education state. So along with those two priorities, I had to identify how am I going to make that happen. I came up with my eight C's, um, which included continuing the direction that Brian started, providing and improving customer service, increasing communication, both internally and externally, engaging in meaningful collaboration, both internally in the department and with our external partners, connecting with schools and districts by visiting them, and improving the climate and culture in the department, focusing on continuous improvement in all that we do, and having a laser commitment to do the very best that I can do in this position. During the past year, I have identified a ninth C, and that is challenges. <laughs> As I am grateful and honored to be in this position, I've also discovered that it has its unique set of challenges. When I jumped in as the interim state superintendent, it was a huge learning curve for me. The number of responsibilities that the state superintendent have are immense. Some of them include being the face and the voice of the department, leading the MDE team of over 500 staff members, being responsible to them and for them, having eight bosses, all of you sitting around the table, <laughs> learning to work with the governor and legislators, serving on multiple commissions, and learning all of the acronyms in the department. <laughs> it truly is like learning a foreign language. Um, but the benefits have been immense. This position has provided me with so many new opportunities. Traveling to Taiwan to sign the renewal of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Ministry of Education um, and MDE. Representing MDE at national conferences such as CCSSO, NASB, and AASA. Addressing and networking with participants at state education conferences, such as MAISA, talk about acronyms, listen to all the acronyms I'm rolling off, uh, MASA, MSBO, and so many, many others. And it's been extremely rewarding. Going to schools and districts and visiting them has been one of the, the best parts of the job. I visited 19 districts this year. Talking with students whose classes and programs come to Lansing being a guest speaker at graduate classes, and then networking with civic business and labor leaders across the state. I'm also very proud of the successes that we've had this past year, and most of them have been focusing on transitions. A change in department leadership, a change in governor, we have some new legislative changes, and of course some changes in the composition of the state board. In all of these transitions, we've managed to maintain and sharpen our focus in the department. So the last three and a half months have been exciting and fulfilling, and it's a journey I am very proud to have experienced. Superintendent Whiston wanted to make Michigan a top 10 education state. That was his vision. So maintaining the stability and continuity at the department level, hopefully, has lent itself to providing some of that calm and that stability at the district level as well. MDE is looking forward to welcoming Dr. Michael Rice to the department sometime this summer. We've developed a transition plan to help him ensure that he has the very best transition to the department so that we can continue to work in the department and he can become familiar with the work in the department. Our plan includes a comprehensive overview of the department, including the top 10 and 10 strategic education plan, our department's 
action plans to support the implementation of the three priorities, details about the state budget process, organizational charts, employee engagement feedback information, partnership district work, and so very, very much more. My goal is to review this transition resource book with him prior to him coming to the department. In the meantime, I do have weekly conversations with Dr. Rice in which I apprise him of the work of the department and some of the issues and challenges that we're facing. So I will also share with him some of the lessons that I've learned during my tenure as interim state superintendent, including the state's education system is a very complex system. And I know that when Brian Whiston came to the department, he felt the same way. Secondly, the state superintendent has a lot of authority, and at the same time, the state superintendent has very little authority. <laughs> Many things that the state superintendent, that people think the state superintendent can just do, just make it happen, are really part of a much more complex system that involves rules and policies and laws and also involves the input from a variety of different stakeholders, such as state board, members of the department, governor, legislators, and also our local districts. And because of this complex system, it's very important that the state superintendent be collaborative and ready to work with all different partners in order to keep the work moving smoothly for our schools, for our districts, and ultimately for the children and the families that we all serve. It's important to find a balance between urgency and patience while maintaining a focused direction. As the educational leader, there is a high degree of urgency in keeping Michigan moving forward, but you also have to balance that with patience as you help a very complex system adapt to change. It's important to value your partners. This is a job that one person cannot do alone. To be successful, you need a team, state board members, MDE, and all of our partners across the state, educators, state leaders, parents, community members, business, and local leaders. And lastly, no, second to the last, Take time to learn. As you've heard me say, the work of the department and the work of the education system is complex. You get, it's important to get to know the people in the department and get to know the work that they do because they are the state superintendent's best partners. And then finally, remember why we are here why we chose to go into education and be educators. We did that because of our passion for children. And it's so important that decisions are made on what is in the best interest for the children that we are here to serve. Having said all of that, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the support from the incredible leadership team that I have here at the department. Their tireless efforts and their consistent support has helped to make the last year that I have had the most rewarding and gratifying as any chapter in my 45-year career as an educator. When Brian Whiston presented the board with the top 10 in 10 strategic plan, and you approved it, it was his wish that that plan would go forward, and he said, let's leave it alone for 10 years and let it work. As the current interim state superintendent, I vowed to stay committed to that vision, to stay true to the top 10 and 10 plan. And the best that we can hope for is that Michael Rice will embrace that commitment to leave Michigan's top 10 and 10 education plan alone, to give it time to work, for the sake of all of the children of Michigan. I am extending my heartfelt appreciation to every member of the State Board of Education for giving me this amazing opportunity to lead the State Department of Education and to be your chair 
for the State Board of Education meetings these past almost 14 months. It has been and continues to be the experience of a lifetime. And it has been my esteemed honor to lead the Department of Education. When Dr. Rice assumes his position, I will go back to my former position as Chief Deputy Superintendent. And my goal is to help and support Michael to ensure that he has a smooth and successful transition to the department. I want to help him to understand the work of the department, to help him maintain the direction that we started, and to keep the momentum going forward so that we can achieve the status of being a top 10 education state. We owe that to the children of the state of Michigan. Thank you so much. And now we will turn to, yes. Before we do that, yes. um, I just have to say something. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you as superintendent. I don't think I've ever had as much open, transparent communication with someone in that seat as I have with you uh, in your role. And I think over the last 14 months, especially over the last six months, you and I have um, built a, a very trusting relationship uh, where we've been able to be very frank and open with one another and commiserate at times. <laughs> um, and, and I just want to say how much I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, you have left very big shoes to fill. And fortunately, you're not going anywhere. So um, you'll continue to be a great help for the next superintendent. Uh, but I think I, it, I couldn't let this moment go by without saying how much we all really appreciate the fact that you stepped in in the hardest of circumstances and really kept this, this department moving forward and did just a phenomenal job. And um, how much I, I, I just really value the work that we've been able to do together. Thank you. That means the world to me, Cassandra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to turn to Laura because Laura, who is our Laura Chang, who is our 2018-19 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Laura is the K-5 Reading and Math Interventionist in v Vicksburg Community School, and she is going to give us her monthly Teacher of the Year presentation. Thank you, Sheila. That is a tough act to follow, but I will do my best to share some of the things happening. Um, and you always do, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. It has been an incredible year of growth and opportunity, and I'm going to highlight a bit of that for you today. <coughs> So um, thank you for allowing me the seat at your table to share about my passion topics this year. Um, some of the topics that I shared on are, are listed there. Differentiating instruction, identifying priority standards, and using data to drive instruction to meet the needs of our students. MTSS in action, meeting the needs of struggling learners by using a team approach while still allowing the students to access grade level curriculum. The Hill Project, WMU, Reading Now Network, the General Education Leadership Network, working hand in hand with schools in West Michigan to impact students and provide opportunities for success. Um, ACEs, initiatives that teachers around the state have put into place to equip children with tools to combat, um, to, to, to build student capacity and beat the odds to, to combat trauma that they may have experienced. Um, enrichment opportunities for all students. I shared some information from the Kalamazoo Area Math and Science Center, where students have been identified from urban and rural districts across Kalamazoo County, um, and then receive access to, to um, rigorous science and math opportunities. I also highlighted strong mentoring and coaching programs across the state. Not because teachers need coaching, but because they deserve it. I provided a number of keynotes um, across the state on what I had hoped to be 
inspiring messages to rising teacher leaders. Um, I shared messages on teacher leadership, developing relationships with students, um, partnering with families, early literacy initiatives to groups of 15 to over 500. One of my favorites this year probably was Frank Moose School District, which is my alma mater. Um, and going back home, so to speak, um, was, was a really neat experience. School visits, buildings in Ann Arbor, Ludington, Delton Kellogg, and others across the state. Um, U of M was kind enough to invite me to be recognized at that basketball game. I had the pleasure of watching Sheila named the 2020 Michigan Teacher of the Year in Rochester Hills. And watching that range of emotions cover Kara's, voice, or Kara's face, that's her in the bottom right corner. Watching her face just brought me right back to that day a year ago. I can't wait to see the impact that she will have on the students and teachers of Michigan. And I shared a, a countless number of um, professional development workshops and presentations on integrating technology into the elementary classroom, using data to drive instruction, um, to meet the diverse needs of learners, and more. I participated in a number of state-level ed policy committees. The Special Education Advisory Council was an exciting new partnership this year for the current Michigan Teacher of the Year to participate in as a non-voting member. And Kara, our 2020 Teacher of the Year, will continue in that council in the fall. The ed Equity and Education Advisory Team, we're examining several indicators, including whole child, learning environments, workforce, leadership, and funding to provide recommendations for all students to have access to an equitable education. The Special Education Needs Determination Steering Committee, working with Dr. K and other stakeholders to, to craft a, a broad shared vision of success for our students with disabilities. The Launch Michigan Educator Support Work Group was a diverse group of stakeholders from the education field and the private sector. We worked together to develop teacher coaching and mentoring recommendations. Governor Whitmer's Educator Advisory Council. Um, our work hasn't begun yet, but um, hopefully will soon as she's gathered educators from across the state to, um, to work together. The MTLAC, this was the 10 regional teachers of the year working together through the year on education issues specific to our region um, and more. It was such an honor to represent the voice of teachers, but more importantly, the voice of students in this work at the state level. A week of professional growth and learning in San Francisco and another week focusing on ed policy in Washington, D.C. brought me together with these 56 dedicated educators from around the world. The, the State Teacher of the Year cycle runs a little bit earlier in Michigan than the vast majority of other states. So we still have several um, gatherings coming up as a cohort of State Teachers of the Year, including the National Forum on Ed Policy in Denver this July, um, heading to Space Camp in July. We'll be at Princeton in October at the Next Steps Conference, in which literally we plan our next steps as State Teachers of the Year, now that we've had this opportunity for growth over a year. Now what? Now what are you doing? Um, and the college football playoff in January that my husband and son are still lobbying for their place. <laughs> <laughs> we are still in negotiations. <laughs> um, a year ago, I never could have imagined the opportunities that were before me this year. 126 events in half the counties in Michigan, across the nation, and across the world. I was able to take advantage of 22 distinct professional learning opportunities, provide 24 keynote addresses to groups of aspiring teachers and current teacher leaders, 66 meetings at the state level to work on ed policy, issues that really affect the teachers and students of Michigan, and more. I've learned so much about teachers, teaching, ed policy, and myself this year. I've learned to take risks. I've learned to embrace discomfort as an opportunity for growth. I've learned that life is not about comfort, it's about purpose. Taking risks when working toward your purpose is something that all teachers need to embrace to become teacher leaders. I've learned that teachers need to hear this, teachers all across the state and nation. Mr. Rogers said it best. I want to give a special thank you to Mimic Insurance for providing the financial support to um, the financial support that I needed to travel across the state and across the nation this year. That was incredible. 
And a special thank you to my building principal, Amy McCaw, and a shout out to my superintendent, Kevin O'Neill, for their support and encouragement, always telling me, Laura, go home, take time. You don't have to be in three places at once. And um, that was incredible. I couldn't have done that without a district, Vicksburg, that I work in. Um, huge thank you to MDE's Office of Educator Excellence, specifically the Recruitment and Recognition Unit, Jen and Josh and Shelby and Marty and Chelsea for all the work behind the scenes to make this such an incredible year of opportunity and growth. And thank you, all of you, for allowing me a seat at this table. I am honored to sit in the presence of true champions for children here. Thank you, Laura. Um, this is Laura's final report to the State Board of Education. We certainly appreciate your ambassadorship, Laura, um, for teachers across the entire state. You have done an amazing job and have been a phenomenal role model for all of all educators. We certainly have enjoyed your monthly reports and um, your inclusion of the Regional Teachers of the Year each month has been, has been uh, a, a really incredible addition. So. We thank you for this past year, and we wish you all the best in all of your future endeavors, and I know there are going to be many of them. So thank, thank you. you. Um, also today, I'm from my notes somewhere. Oh, here it is here. Also today, this is the last state board meeting that Chris Claver from Gongwer will be covering. Um, he has covered State Board of Education meetings for the last 26 years. He has taken a new position at Gongwer and will be handling these response, handing these responsibilities to a new reporter who is sitting next to him this morning. Chris, would you like to introduce um, your colleague who is joining you this morning? Yeah, this is Jordan Hermani. Um, she, this is her second day with Gongwer. Um, <laughs> yeah, she will be taking over all of my reporting responsibilities plus a little bit. Um, and I have taken a position as all of the technology of development and making Gongwer better. Congratulations. Well, congratulations and thank you for covering the state board meeting for all these years. Wish you all the best, Chris. Um, next item on the agenda is a vote to convene to close session. May I please have a motion to convene to close session as allowed by the Open Meetings Act? This motion will be followed by a roll call vote. I move Sandra. that the State Board of Education meet in closed session under subsection 8H of the Open Meetings Act to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure under subsection 13.1G of the Freedom of Information Act, specifically information or records subject to the attorney-client privilege. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Yeah, I guess, you know, we're kind of early um, in the uh, agenda. We got, we're 20 minutes ahead. We don't have much that we could pull ahead, but I'm just wondering, because I know there are people that may be coming at one o'clock, and if are we going to reconvene at an one hour at one o'clock, even yes. though we're leaving twenty minutes early? Yes. Okay. All right. Never yeah, mind. Yeah, I'm not starting. Back I didn't know early. if you wanted to pull up, you know, the legislative update or something, and do that or something. But if you don't, you'd... well, if we're doing the. I would like to have um, all the board members present for the legislative oh, okay. update. Some of okay. the other items that okay. are this we afternoon. I mean, that's yeah. a good idea, Tom. Right. Okay. So, we appreciate that. And, and just so you know, we do need six votes to go into closed session. We currently have six members here. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> we need six? Yes. This requires a two-thirds two -thirds oh. vote. Hmm. We've got a little power in the heat. <laughs> we'll take the roll call oh, before, you, before you consider it. Right a little it. power. <laughs> All right. So we have motion. We have second. We've, we've concluded discussion. And uh, Marilyn, will you take a roll call vote, please? Yes. Fecto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Hughes absent. Ramos Fontini? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Hilly's absent. Ulbrich? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. So we will convene, move to a closed session. We will reconvene in the open session in this room at approximately 1 o'clock.